to look at you, or should I look at the? I mean, at the at the um, camera or camera. Like, now, yeah. look at the camera. I never did that before. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll try to do that. So, hi, I'm Edwin Rich, and this is Dialogues on how to build a culture of empathy. And I'm so pleased to have uh, Jody Helpern here Thank today. You. Uh, welcome. Thank you. I'm so pleased to be here. Well, I wanted to give a little background about you. Uh, first, you're uh, you're associate professor of community health and human development at UC Berkeley and a psychiatrist with a background uh, in philosophy, and you investigate how emotions and imagination shape healthcare decisions of clinicians and patients, and you've had a long-term, uh, a long-standing uh, focus on empathy, and you've written this book, this uh, wonderful book, uh, From Detached Concern to Empathy, Humanizing uh, uh, Medical Practice. So, um, in terms of uh, introduction, is there more you'd like to uh, share about your background and what you think is important just to kind of introduce yourself? Um, no, I think that just that the book was inspired when I was uh, beginning medical school and a, a while ago now and really felt that um, there was this premium put on detachment in, in physicians and trying to maintain a certain distance from patients and it felt very uncomfortable. Hmm. Well, what we thought we would do in this uh, in this uh, discussion is just go through the chapters of the book um, and just kind of discuss them, and maybe you could share a little bit about each chapter in each section. Then we can have a little dialogue about it, and Great. just go as far as we can, you know, for the hour. Um, you were just talking about uh, this experience that you had, uh, and I think you actually mentioned it in the preference for chapter one about uh, kind of what started you on thinking about the importance of, of empathy in, in, in healthcare? Well, actually, I have to say, I know this is just a, a contemporary event, but, you know, we're here doing this interview in a weekend where the New Newton, Connecticut, Newtown, Connecticut shooting occurred, and where Barack Obama has given three speeches, including one last night in a church. And what was so moving to me is his capacity to cry in public and to express his grief and to say, what really need to be said, which is not, oh, we'll get better soon, but this is something we, you know, will never recover from in a certain sense for the parents and the families, that this is an incredibly tragic event. And so I think the same was true when I, in the case in the intro or preface of my book, is I was caring for, uh, the issue for me is how healing it is if we can be open about grieving and that even the most tragic things in life are better dealt with communally if we can be honest about how much patients deaths leave a mark on us as doctors and if we have to pretend that there's nothing to worry about when people die that we um, we make patients and their families feel crazy because they're suffering you know uh, Primo Levi the Holocaust survivor said if you're if you're suffering in front of someone who responds neutrally you feel like you're going to disappear. So I was very struck when I was a medical student by the stance we were required to take to try to act as doctors as neutral parties. So when I was at the VA hospital in Connecticut and I was a third year medical student, there was a patient, Mr. K, who I was very close to. And he was a man in his 60s who was in a second marriage and very happily married just for a year or two and then had very bad heart problems, heart attacks. And he and his wife were very much anticipating his recovering well enough to go home from the hospital and garden and be together after they just had a few years of a finally happy marriage for both of them. And um, that was what we had told the wife the day before this event, that we thought he would leave the hospital. And I remember, this is over 20 years ago, and I remember it vividly. And then I was on call, and as part of being on call as a medical student in the third year, you're trained to get excited about technological events and to act in a very detached way. So the whole medical team gets excited about whether there'll be a code, a cardiac arrest, in which the team will run in and do all kinds of procedures to try to resuscitate a patient. And that's actually a big exciting event in this detached world. And I was with my medical resident and there was a cardiac code called and we ran and he was so excited and he said, Jody, that you're going to get to put in um, some pulmonary lines. You get to do some different kinds of procedures. This is so exciting. And we ran and I saw that it was actually this patient, Mr. K. And I saw that he was actually cyanotic or blue. He had been without oxygen for a long enough amount of time that if we saved him, he would probably be you know, very close to a brain dead state and a vegetative state. And it wasn't the kind of state he wanted to return to. And I felt the tragedy 
of this man that I'd come to know humanly and yet I was supposed to be in this very technological mindset and the challenge of it and then afterward my resident telling me that there was even afterward no time to grieve or you know no nobody acted like anything tragic happened from a human perspective so that's what my preface is about mm. so that, that was really uh, kind of the beginning would you say of, of really starting to look at the, the importance of the emotions and empathy and connection yes we really started becoming this is like oh this is really important I need to kind of delve into this yes and I knew that even though I knew there was something wrong with all of us being trained to be so detached because I myself had to participate in a cardiac code I also knew that there were reasons that doctors felt they had to do that that it was hard to do procedures so I knew it was a very hard problem that there were two sides of it at least and that it wasn't an obvious problem to solve and there's a reason in the history of medicine it's still what probably the biggest unsolved challenge of what it is to be a physician Hmm. Is this kind of like uh, in the show House? Uh, is is that kind of his position, kind of detached? And it's like, oh, the I don't care about the patient. It's just the problem is so interesting and fascinating. Or I am embarrassed to say that I haven't seen House. I'm oh, probably no. the only person in the world who hasn't seen it, so I have to see it. But I've heard that. Okay. I should watch it for teaching purposes. So um, then, uh, in uh, chapter one of the book. Uh, you actually go over, you talk about uh, emotional irrationality and give an overview of the book. So maybe we should have, just begin with, kind of frame, like, that you have, I think, what is it, five chapters? Uh, I mean, six chapters. You have six chapters. And I thought maybe we could start with just a little overview and then actually go into some of the uh, chapters, like... Um, Chapter one, failures of emotional communication in medical practice. Do you want me to start? Oh yeah, would you like to just kind of, kind of give an overview okay. of the book? Sure, sure. Um, well, I'll give you an overview, but then I'll talk about chapter one, which is a really important um, real case that I was involved in that I want to talk about. But the overview would be that um, the book begins with this case. The whole book is about this case. It's the case of Ms. G, and I'll go into that in a moment. And that case is probably what is most influential in medical education today from my work, because I think it's such a painful and difficult um, situation. So I'll talk about that. But in that case, the doctors believed that they were doing what was best for the patient. And not only, uh, I mean, it was confusing. And one of the major confusions in that case is because people are not trained in medicine for actual skillful clinical empathy. They're trained to either be detached or to be sympathetic where you have an emotional feeling or reaction to other people where you feel almost as if you're in the same boat with them and therefore make decisions almost as if you were the person facing a cancer treatment decision, et cetera, with the patient without realizing how much your own projections, desires, and values are influencing your capacity to listen to this distinct person, the patient. So you make big mistakes because you, pro you project your own experiences onto other people, and that's what the case is meant to show. So then I basically go in, in the next chapter, um, managing emotions as a professional ideal to the whole history of detachment in medicine which goes back, way back, but there's a very important series of events in the early 20th century when American medicine was becoming, quote, scientific, um, and especially around Johns Hopkins and other um, uh, prime settings, people like Sir William Osler were really developing the identity of a profess professional doctor, that you would wear a white coat, that you would walk around and do bedside rounds with a flock of medical students and interns and residents following you, and that whole bedside rounds um, was instead of going into a patient's sick room the way a nurse or a social worker would and a doctor had always done before then with concern and with putting your hand on their hand, Ozer made it um, a, dis a scientific setting in which you kept a distance and used um, your questions and your um, technology as such as it was at that time, your stethoscope or your using your hands a certain way to try to examine the patient as a specimen and to present the patient that way. And so it was the beginning of the idea that the patient was an object of scientific reflection and um, also wrote a very important essay about um, the need, called Equanimitas, about the need 
for doctors to maintain so emotionally detached that their blood vessels wouldn't even constrict when they saw horrible sights. And he actually had a very Cartesian um, view of the mind in which he really did feel that emotions obscured thought. We now are very aware in behavioral psych uh, economics and in um, various fields of psychological research that emotions actually are very important for thinking and that all thinking is, is influenced by emotional processing. So the idea that we would be a better thinker if we had no emotion at all is something that doesn't make sense to us anymore, but it was very much how people thought in Ozer's day. So, and he's someone who had to go right back to work after what he felt he did, right after his own daughter died. So he really believed that detachment would make doctors, he cared a lot about patients, but he believed that this detached stance would make doctors much better able to provide professional care. So I go into that history and why doctors really do strive for detachment. They're also very afraid of burning out. And that's something I still study now a lot, uh, you know, around the world is models of empathic care without burnout or with, you know, why. And actually we have research now showing that physicians who learn specific skills of clinical empathy are actually less likely to burn out, but that's going way to the end of the book. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that chapter is about the history of detachment in, in, that leads up to recent American medicine. Um, and, and that goes from Ozer in the early 20th century through the 50s and 60s, the era, speaking of television, if you think of the Mad Men model of uh, masculinity, the kind of detached man who doesn't give really much of a care, obviously, about people, whatever's going on inside, that was when these, uh, that was very trendy then for medical journals like New England Journal of Medicine and JAMA to have articles about how doctors had a very special um, utterly detached concern for patients in which the same detachment that enabled them to cut into cadavers was what allowed them to have special professional concern for patients. And then going up right until um, 1999, the Society for General Internal Medicine, a very respected society for all of us, um, they had a statement about um, empathic care as providing care for the patient without feeling those feelings of the patient yourself. So there was a big concern about keeping a certain distance um, for reasons that are understandable. But it's only, uh, when the book came out originally in 2001, it's been revised in 2011, um, but in 2001 there was really nothing much being said about the importance of actual emotional engagement in medicine. So I go up to the history up to 2001, that's that chapter. Do you want me to keep going over? Yeah, that? should we just do an overview of the full, full okay. book and okay. then go into we'll, yeah, okay. a little faster? Yeah, <laughs> we'll go into depth. Okay. One thing I was thinking is maybe you could move your camera uh, down a little bit so so we have you framed a little bit more. That better. Uh huh. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So then the next chapter is called emotional reasoning, and it's where my philosophy. I have a PhD in philosophy, um, where I bring in. Um, what we know from philosophy of mind about the critical role that emotions play in, a, in, in, rea, in our understanding and apprehension of um, reality in a special socially, socially uh, informed parts of reality, which is basically to say we can't really understand what's going on with other people without making use of our own emotional imagination. And that chapter really makes that case as strongly as I could make it at the time. There's even more evidence for that since this first came out in 2001. And then the next chapter, so I feel what happens is, so we begin the book with the, the challenge for physicians of detachment. We go into a case in which physicians were very sympathetic and projected their feelings and made very bad decisions because they weren't even aware. They thought they were detached, they were actually unconsciously overly sympathetic, and no one had given them the skills to pay attention to their own emotions. Then we go into the history of, recent history of American medicine that led up to the ideal of detachment. And then in this chapter that I just mentioned, emotional reasoning, we go into the philosophical um, literature and what we really know and the cognitive psychology literature and really making the case for the specific way that emotions do play a role in cognition and in social cognition, which is my, my um, positive argument for why genuine emotional engagement between doctors and patients is so necessary. Um, I'll just mention a lot of research since then has shown that for physicians to get an adequate history from a patient and, and think diagnostically in a full sense, their emotions do play a role. But that's kind of um, predicted by my philosophical discussion, but it hadn't been empirically proved. My book um, has um, been part of a movement where people have now been doing empirical research, and now we really have a lot of evidence that doctors will get a better history and understand a patient diagnostically better if they're emotionally engaged. Um, so that's the chapter on emotional reasoning. 
And then the next chapter is the core chapter of the book, the concept of clinical empathy. And that's the chapter that I spent many years thinking and researching um, about before I published the book. And that's my own theory of clinical empathy, what it is, what skills are involved, and how it can, um, this ideal, this norm of clinical empathy that will allow doctors not to become overly sympathetic and project their emotions so much, but that will allow them to stay emotionally engaged with patients. And that's and chapter four. That's mm -hmm. chapter four. We could talk, that's really what mostly I, I'm asked to talk about. And then, um, in this case, that leads to the, one of the problems in the case that I'll discuss with you is that the, the doctors thought they were respecting the patient's autonomy by basically abandoning her. So then now that I have a theory of clinical empathy put out there, I can talk about the role of clinical listening and clinical empathy in respecting patient autonomy. So that patients don't just know what they want when they're faced with tragedy. They need us to empathically engage with them and help them um, developmentally, help people um, basically scaffold a person in crisis, a person who's just lost the person they, they love the most in the world. Um, think about the parents in, in Newtown, Connecticut right now. Many of them probably want to end their lives. Um, how does a doctor help somebody like mm. that? Not by being detached and just doing whatever the patient asks. That's not respecting autonomy. But at such a time, like the patient that I talk about in my book, people need us to really um, allow their grief to leave its mark on us, and, as um, Barack Obama's done. And then they can begin to re, 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 um, uh, return to the capacity to, to face their own grief. So respecting patient autonomy is about the bioethics tradition of respect for autonomy, but it puts an emotional um, architecture behind it in communication between patients and doctors. And then ultimately the last chapter, Cultivating Empathy in Medical Practice, talks about some of the um, structural skills that we can help people develop, what that would mean in medical education, um, sets out a research agenda, and also talks about the limitations, that we shouldn't be overly intrusive with patients, that patients have a right to not be understood as well um, in some of their complexities. And I bring psychoanalytic thought to that and talk about the, the critical role of the unconscious. Hmm, that's, okay, that's so that's, yeah, that's a great, I mean, it, it's really a whole, uh, sounds like a whole course, uh, really. Uh, I don't know, do you do a course on empathy or? You no, know, I've always, at Berkeley, I'm a professor of public health, uh, I'm, my, my title is professor of bioethics and um, uh, medical humanities. But, so my courses are usually in bioethics, like public health ethics. So I've never had the option of teaching a course on clinical empathy. I do. Um, teach medical students, nursing students, and social workers at Berkeley and around the world in small seminars where they present their dilemmas to me and we help them develop the skills. But I've never had a chance mm -hmm. to do a course on any academic um, subject related to this book. It would be so exciting. Yeah, it would be. It'd be I think it would be a real contribution. Because, well, we can dig in as long as we Thank have you. time for it. Uh, um, and we can also go start today if we run out of time. Oh, but yeah, I, continue I, on. We could do a yeah. chapter you know, on each <laughs> Coffee on each uh, chapter. I'd love it. I'd okay, love it. I, I'm here to support that because it, it's a really fantastic book. And so you've really, you really start with uh, with a with a case study, something that kind of inspired you to kind of go down this path, and then you go into the uh, the the medical field, how the medical field has uh, the the values and approaches that the medical field has had uh, towards uh, relating with patients, and then you also bring in the uh, philosophy, the underlying philosophical uh, uh, positions that kind of support that and then you kind of bring that to uh, kind of the present and then you're making your case that we need um, clinical empathy and you kind of articulate how that empathy uh, would look and and then kind of how that would go into the future is kind of the basic um, arc I guess of, of the book um, well, well said. <laughs> yeah, so I'm doing a little bit of reflective reflection here, empathic reflection. <laughs> so I hope I can model the empathy that we're talking about. You are, you are. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, which where should we start then? Where do you where where should we pick that up? Chapter one. Do you want to go dig in a little bit more there? Or? Well, I mean, really, depending on how much time we have, you know, I and we can do. Uh, however you would like, um, and I'm happy to do more than one meeting depending on your your desires, but I, what has been very moving to people is to hear the case of Ms. G. Mm -hmm. So I could, um, I hadn't thought about this before, but I could read the case. 
Uh -huh. that would okay, be sure. That'd be a good start and from the think, beginning. Uh -huh. It's long. It's long though, so that you have to let me know if that's because I think summarizing it isn't as good as hearing what really happened. Okay. Um, so we'll see what you think because you can always edit us. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see if I can get it quickly. I hadn't thought we would be um, doing it. So. Yeah, we can do multiple. Uh, you know. Uh, uh, explorations. I've, I've done with some authors, we've actually gone through every chapter and then created separate uh, video clips of each chapter and so we can go in as great of depth as you'd like. Uh, I love this because I think that your project is so important and I love to, the idea of being in some archival way a, a contributor to it. So. Uh, thanks. Um, a medical surgical team at an East Coast hospital requested a psychiatry consultation for Ms. G a 56-year-old white woman with diabetes mellitus who had just had her second above-the-knee amputation. She had a long history of kidney failure, was not a candidate for a transplant, and required dialysis three times a week. Although she had willingly come into the hospital for surgery, she was now refusing dialysis, even though she knew that without it, she would die in a matter of days. She refused to tell the medical team why, so they wanted both a psychiatrist and an ethicist to evaluate her decision-making capacity. What happened next was a disturbing experience that has inspired this inquiry into the role of emotions in the patient-physician relationship. As a trainee on the psychiatry service, I was sent to first see the patient and report back. I walked into Ms. G's hospital room and was shocked to see a child-sized bony woman curled up under the covers, her eyes closed, her head shrouded, and her back to the world. She was in obvious pain, her face tensed and mouth wide open as if to yell, although silent, reminding me of Edward Munch's painting, The Scream. My first instinct was to run to her medical team and say, give her some more morphine. But I remembered that one reason the medical team had called for a consult was that no safe amount of pain medication seemed to affect Ms. G's pain. We're giving her enough morphine to keep a large man comfortable, the intern said when he called me. In view of her agony, the question of whether she had adequate capacity to make medical decisions seemed strangely, strangely detached from the problem at hand, like asking of a person being tortured on a rack begging to die has the right to make that decision. What she needed was to get off the rack, but high doses of morphine were not relieving her pain. After introducing myself, I spontaneously started a guided imagery session with her, as I had often done with cancer patients in severe pain who found answering questions too uncomfortable. I asked her to imagine herself in a more relaxing place, the beach, for example, to see and hear the ocean, feel the sand and the soft breeze on her skin. Her face spontaneously relaxed. She kept her eyes shut, and gradually her breathing normalized. She then seemed briefly to go to sleep. I returned a few hours later and found a group of Ms. G's women friends talking anxiously outside her door. After telling me how worried they were about Ms. G, one of her friends said, ask her about her husband, that creep. When I walked into her room, she was again in terrible agony. I began another guided imagery session with her and she relaxed and seemed much more comfortable. I waited for several minutes and saw that she was not asleep. Knowing that time was of the essence and that I, need to, need, I needed to learn something about her state of mind, I then asked her, is there anything besides your body that is hurting you? Her eyes shut. She began to speak to me for the first time. Yes, but I don't want to talk about it, she murmured. I just want to go to sleep. I waited silently to see if she would say more. After a long pause, she spoke very quietly. My husband doesn't love me anymore, she began. He told me that he's in love with someone else. He moved in with her while I was in the hospital. He said that with my amputations and other medical problems, he could never be attracted to me. She started to cry. Listening to her story, I imagined facing a future in which I was literally cut off at the knees and abandoned by my, and abandoned by my husband with no legs to stand on. But before I could say anything, Ms. G turned to me and looked at me directly for the first time. She looked furious, and I felt almost afraid that she would throw something at me or try to hurt herself. She screamed out, why the hell did you ask me to talk about this? I told you I didn't want to talk. I just want to be left in peace to sleep and never wake up. Making me think about what he said is the cruelest thing anyone has ever done to me. Don't ask me any more questions. Get out of here. Get out of here. 
Ms. G was refusing treatment and would die rather than think about the fact that her husband had rejected her. Feeling hopeless, I went to talk to her other doctors and ethicists on the case. Earlier that day, Ms. G had told her surgeon that she knew that she would die without dialysis and that this was in fact her preference. She said that her future as a double amputee was bleak and she knew she would suffer further complications of her diabetes, such as blindness. He discussed this conversation with the ethicists. When I told them about her husband, they both commented on how alone Ms. G must feel, but said that she was making an informed decision and we needed to respect her right to refuse treatment. They warned me against my apparent emotional reaction to her, pointing out, you can't, and my desire to rescue her. And they said, you can't take her home with you, so leave her alone. I then went to meet with her long-standing internist, Dr. L, a man with a reputation for caring about his patients. Doesn't all this talk about respecting her right to die seem inadequate given how abandoned she must feel? I asked. Yes, he nodded and sighed with resignation. But think about it humanely. What kind of life does she face now? Wouldn't you want to die if you had lost your spouse, your legs, your kidneys, and faced a future of blindness and other medical problems? Let, let's, not, let's not ask her any more questions. Let's just make her as comfortable as possible and accept her decision to die. As a trainee, I needed to consult a supervising psychiatrist about my approach to this case. I told him not only about the patient's situation, but also about the medical team's difficulty in handling the case, ranging from the surgeon and medical ethicist's detached emphasis on rights to the attending physician's sympathetic projections. We discussed the fact that only two years before, after her first above-the-knee amputation, Ms. G had felt very depressed and hopeless, hopeless, yet with psychiatric treatment, had recovered her optimism and energy. She had gone on to enjoy her work as an artist a great deal over the past two years and to continue her active social life, including her friends as well as her husband. Her past recovery gave me hope that with enough support, she could work her way through the current crisis. After all, she had voluntarily come in for this above the knee amputation. I mean, she needed it, but she had planned it, and she'd come in in a hopeful state of mind before her husband told her he was leaving her. While she had first felt very depressed about the idea of a second amputation and needing to be a wheelchair user, after a month before the surgery, she had prepared her home and made it accessible and had adapted to the, at least the expectation that she would be able to do um, so many of the things, including the kind of artwork she did um, as a wheelchair user. Um, the doctor's notes in the charts had recommended the surgery just two days before, saying that she had years of reasonable health and functioning ahead. For example, this concern about blindness at the present time from her diabetes, she had no eye problems. Um, so in their notes up until this event from, with the husband's catastrophic news, everyone predicted her to have a good quality of life in the upcoming years. The senior psychiatrist agreed that all this was probably true, but that we could do little for Ms. G because she had the, we had to respect her right to refuse treatment. And she was adamantly refusing both treatment and talking to a psychiatrist. And he said, given that psychiatric care requires cooperation, there was little we could do. And um, he then looked at me and said, look, the decision is hers. Uh, she was not impaired enough from lack of dialysis to be unable to think cognitively. So she has the capacity to decide. And then he said, even if we set aside our own emotional reactions, our, including our wishes to rescue, it's an objective fact that she faces a terrible future. This is what the head of psychiatry said. It's an objective fact that she faces a terrible future. We need this to leave this woman to die in peace and guard against imposing our own wishes on her. A conference was held with the surgeon, her longstanding internist, the ethicist, the, the, the uh, head psychiatrist, and all agreed within minutes, within minutes, that Ms. G's decision to terminate treatment needed to be respected. She was given this news as well as more pain medication and she became lethargic but comfortable for the first time since hearing her husband's terrible news. She died soon afterwards, never again speaking the painful words that her husband had said to her. So this is, this is the story that really frames the whole book. Uh, yes. Then yes. it's like, uh, this is, and this is like the dynamics that happen between the doctors and the patient and you and the patient and uh, how a situation like this or could, could be ha uh, handled, I guess. And it's clearly very tragic. I want to say one thing. In the years of presenting this work around the world, I'm always very aware that I was focusing on the, on the apparent detachment as well as the um, 
inadvertent sympathetic projection of the physicians and the problem with medical training when I wrote this book. So what's markedly absent here is the experience of the nurses, the social workers, um, hospital, clergy. Um, those figures are markedly absent from the way the case was discussed. And in fact, the doctors dominated the decision to turn up the morphine. So. Okay, so uh, in this case, you're, you're looking at the doctors are, are kind of detached from the uh, a patient and yeah, kind of just looking at her from a, in a detached way and or they're uh, sympathetic at all. Oh, if I was in that situation, you know, it would be a uh, end of life. I know it wouldn't be worth living either or something like that. And, so is it, are those the two qualities you're yeah, kind of looking actually, at? Yeah, actually, I don't think anybody, part of what the book seeks to show in many ways, especially through the science of emotions and cognition, um, but what this case already begins to suggest is nobody's actually detached. Every doctor mm. there, all those um, the cognitive predictions, this is probably the core philosophical point of the book, uh, besides the ethics of caring and empathy, is the cognitive predictions that every doctor made um, two days before her husband told her he was leaving her, they all wrote in the charts that she had an excellent prognosis. Now they all said she had a terrible prognosis. Mm. They didn't even notice how much their catastrophic thinking had you know, blinded them um, prognostically. And they didn't notice because why were they making su such catastrophic predictions all of a sudden? They were making them because she felt catastrophic about her future because she was in a state of extreme anguish of her, about her husband's rejection. And they resonated with that state. They were affected as human beings. They felt the horror that she was feeling of being so vulnerable post-surgery, um, about to adapt to needing a wheelchair and being abandoned by her life partner. And that somehow triggered in these able-bodied male doctors a feeling that this woman um, in a wheelchair, who would be using a wheelchair, who would be husbandless, had nothing to live for, even though she was actually, you know, she'd be somebody who would be very, live and adapt very well with wheelchair use because she did art that didn't depend on that. She had an incredible, robust community. She had shown resilience to adapting to many other life issues. Um, but all that was gone because of some emotional sense that they had of sympathetic projection and whatever they thought about gender or disability or who knows what that made them as able-bodied men think that a woman um, without a husband at that point would have a life no longer worth living. Oh, okay. So uh, up to the point they where they... They were really detached. Mm -hmm. Oh, they yeah. Weren't, they weren't trained to look into how their own emotions could be used in service of helping the patient as opposed to projecting and as factual projections because when emotions can't be processed and dealt with as emotions, they often just show up as um, inaccurate predictions of certainty. This is person has a terrible future and they also show up in urgency, anxiety to act too quickly. Let's turn up the morphine right away. Mm -hmm. So emotions lead to um, urgent inappropriate actions and um, overgeneralized catastrophic predictions when they're not otherwise processed. So uh, Which doctors uh, do that all the time. Sorry. So, so to begin with, the, the doctors that thought that she would have uh, still many years of productive life, that that was a pos you know, still, yeah. so they were kind of yeah. hopeful about that. Yeah. They saw yeah. that. So then when they heard that uh, the husband had left her and that she was in, you know, this depression about it, that they were still thinking that they were detached, but that they were feeling the emotions and processing those emotions, uh, you know, maybe behind the scenes and it was affecting their decisions. Yes, and it's not very important. It's not because they just heard that. They met with her and saw the site that I begin with, which is a person who looks like she's being emotionally, like she's being tortured on a rack. A rack. Um, she looked like she was being tortured emotionally. And so they had a very human response, which is let's end the suffering. And they also felt very helpless and impotent because she, this is a psychoanalytic part, is she was kicking everybody out of her room. She made sure her woman friends wouldn't, she wouldn't let her friends in to talk with her. She wouldn't let anybody soothe her or uh, connect with her because she felt so abandoned by her husband. And she said to me, she was so angry, she yelled at me that t making her talk or connecting with her was the cruelest thing that anybody had done to her. So she was full of anger and venom and that also put everybody off when in fact, as a psychiatrist, I can tell you 
that her anger was the healthiest thing she had going now, I can say 20 years later, because that was actually an emotional way that she was reaching out to me. And if I had actually been able to understand that and stay with her longer, she could have, we could have used that as the beginning of a therapeutic alliance. Because clearly she was ending her life not just because she thought she had nothing to live for anymore, but because of the shame and anger evoked by her husband's horrible timing and terrible abandonment. She was not the kind of person from her history who would have necessarily decided not to live without her husband if they had had a planned divorce or something like that. But she was in a state of catastrophic shame, rage, and it came out as these very rational decisions everybody was making that her future was no longer worth living. But instead, what she really needed was to express her anger and have, have us grasp her anguish and tolerate it and begin the psychotherapeutic work from there. And that would be the empathic part is to be present with her to hear what it is that uh, what it is that she's feeling yes. but, but stay present with it yes yes and and actually to resonate with it to maybe yes. reflect it yes. and to let her start uh, working through yes. the uh, the dynamics there but doing yes. it in connection with others yes yes so that it was not bad that she affected us so seriously when we see a patient in in pain, or we feel we were around people with terrible suffering. This is my allusion tonight, today to Obama. We need to be. We they need to have an effect on us, and you know, affectivity, emotional impact. Otherwise, it's the Primo Levi situation. You're telling people stories of the Holocaust. This was his experience, and they're acting like you're talking to them about you know the price of tea somewhere. And I think that if that, that makes people feel dehumanized. So it was very good that we all felt um, her suffering in a very visceral way. But if we had been really trained in the skills of clinical empathy, this is where training is really important, education, we would have recognized that this was affecting us and that we could do something with it. We could use it to sit with her and um, show her that we were resonating and be curious about what really was making her, this is the most important part that I haven't mentioned yet, is what was missing. The difference between sympathy and projection and skillful clin clinical empathy, they both involve resonating with the patient and the patient moving us, but the crucial difference in skillful clinical empathy is to be genuinely curious about what's going on for the patient here and now and not take strong emotions at face value as the obvious thing. So. Everyone thought that her strong expression of hopelessness about the future was the only important feeling involved. But with any curiosity at all, in retrospect, as I mentioned, she wasn't just feeling despair about the future, she was feeling shame and anger in the present. And curiosity would have been um, to recognize that there was more to her despair about the future, that in fact that might not even be a persistent, enduring thing for her, but that right now the shame and anger were, were needed to be addressed. And it's not that we had to know all that at the time, um, but we needed to be curious about why she had to die so urgently. And to, the way to um, handle that curiosity with a patient when they're in so, so much distress is not to suddenly ask them a ton of questions when she doesn't want that but is to just simply reflect back what they're expressing. And my, my advice is always to medical students and social workers and nurses, just say um, something that shows the patient that you hear their feelings, but that you are curious about why now. So um, what I could have said to her at some point was, you feel like you can't go on with living after this happened to you with him uh, right now. Right now, you can't imagine living with this. The words right now are very useful words. They raise a question without putting the patient under too much pressure to provide answers. They just raise the thought that someone's um, overtaken by a tragic mood state. So that's the kind of curiosity we all should have had about her and ourselves. Why was everybody feeling that this was all so intolerable that we had to end her life right now? Mm. So the, the everyone was kind of had that sense of uh, kind of that intolerance and, and uh, saying, okay, we, we're, they're going to go along with her desire to end her life. But if you would have had that uh, empathy, that would have been being present with her, her hearing her. And uh, it's kind of like, what is your energy for doing that too? And it sounds like the energy is that curiosity. Yes, uh, and curiosity is, is, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. And the, the curiosity is kind of like a, a way of, 
of kind of being present with her and kind of uh, giving her space or giving the patient space to let them go deeper into their experience and so it kind of un unfolds so they can start working with kind of what's going on, the emotions that are going on there. It's, it, I like to use the word space. Curiosity opens a little wedge when there's catastrophic feeling and thinking in everyone, in the patient and in the caregivers. Curiosity, I love your way of describing it. It is a burst of you know energy. It is a breath of fresh air. It is basically a way, it's like breathing and mindfulness, and they're all related. Um, mindfulness and breathing helps take a moment to become curious and think, is there something I'm missing here? I always teach um, students that the worst thing they can say to patients is, I know how you feel. Mm -hmm. And the best thing they can say to people is, tell me what I'm missing here. So with Ms. G, if we had been more curious about what we were so, every, we were, we were, um, shut down and limited by our anxiety over her suffering. And anxiety constricts perspective. Curiosity broadens perspective so new data, new ideas, new thinking can enter in. And the, the strange thing I'm saying is that even in terrible situations of suffering, it can help a patient not only to let their pain be inscribed on you, which you do need to do, but to also then at the very same time, you're a clinician, this is clinical empathy, this isn't being a friend, have a bit of curiosity about why now? What can we do about this? Because that's where coping ideas will come in. Well, you know, for we can kind of explore this. So what you do in the book is you're really kind of taking this story and just really breaking it down into all the components, starting with the, um, you know, the ideal, the previous ideal of that detachment, uh, and then you know the sympathy, and you kind of explore that. Uh, the one thing I want to bring up for me, my interest in this is you're, you're talking about the patient and, and doctor patient relationship. Uh, and I'm very interested in also a culture of empathy that, you know, this, pa this, this relationship uh, happens within a, within a cultural context. So the, you know, the, the woman had a, the patient uh, had a relationship with her husband and there was kind of like a lack of empathy kind of happening within that relationship. She was disconnected Definitely. from her friends. She's like cutting off and they're not, they're having difficulty. Uh, there's maybe resilience in terms of her long term having kind of had an empathic, you know, environment. There's the doctors who, uh, you know, are, are they empathic between each other? Uh, are they empathic with their families? Is it nurtured in their, is it, so there's a whole chain of empathic relationships, every relationship can have an empathic uh, dynamic, and so I'm very interested in the broad, whole cultural empathy. But you know, this is like one kind of uh, area. To, and what's interesting is that the the insights that we learn from this one area are applicable to other areas of life as well. So it's kind of universal in a sense. Well, that's what I love about your project, Edwin. And I think that it really is, is um, lovely to do. You just, you just showed how it's a web. And I think it's completely true. In fact, when you say culture, there's also in this case, I think a very, I, my current work has to do with people adapting to illness and disability and remaking their lives. And I think the cultural attitudes towards, you know, uh, disability play in here and I think cultural attitudes about I mean it, you're talking about the actual ways that she was or wasn't supported the husband was very narcissistic and that's a lack of empathy um, the doctors are were complicated individuals in an organization that for example a bureaucracy that wasn't very empathic towards their needs and I think in healthcare system as we put doctors under more and more and more time pressure and more and more bureaucratic um, dehumanizing institutional pressures that affects their empathy um, and I think there was also the fact that this was you know a, 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 an able-bodied male young medical group taking care of a woman who they saw as a middle-aged woman who would be a wheelchair user and now not have a husband there were all sorts of this is you know again going back 20 years hopefully be a little bit better now but there was not the kind of appreciation of living with health differences um, which is what my current work looks at and I think that um, that's a very important area for the culture of empathy is how we help each other live with different kinds of disabilities, what, what happens when people need to depend on and support each other in, in ways, um, you know, with our American culture of individualism, we are much less welcoming 
of um, in our communities, we're not as inclusive, anywhere as inclusive as the, the better countries like the Scandinavian countries that I visited. Um, I think a woman in her situation would have um, not, their, her life wouldn't have seemed to suddenly lack quality in the same way in a different cultural setting. Okay, so uh, should we go through the chapters then uh, uh, to uh, kind of do this uh, chapter by chapter, un un unpack, unravel, and kind of explore these different uh, aspects? Um, your 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 the, patience. Um, you you can decide. I mean, you can we can okay. go right whichever level you want to do it at. Okay. Oh yeah, what, and also uh, what works for you. I, and just tell me when we're out of time. I mean, I don't know what your schedule is. Uh, we can and we can always pick it up at a at a later. Point in time too, let's, if, if we need can, be. I love talking with you. I'd say let's go till ten thirty today. Okay. Okay, That's, so that means we might just do one more major sort of area, and then we could plan. Is that does that work for you? Yeah, that works. And then do uh -huh. and, then, and then have another phone conference soon for follow up. Yeah, great. Okay. Uh -huh. And uh, so, do you feel that was chapter one was covered uh, well yes. enough? Or yes. and then we're yes. into two. Um, the uh, professional ideal, managing emotions is a professional ideal. So that's kind of that notion of uh, detachment uh, as, as was a value within society, I mean, within the medical practice. And you kind of had touched on that a little bit. You want to deal more about, you know, how that came about and what that all means? I think what I'll do now, just for the sake of brevity, is I mm -hmm. already touched on the history of detachment and Sir William Osler and these, these traditions. Of uh, what I think I'd like to say now a little bit more is what people said in terms of the rationale for detachment, and what we know now empirically. Mm -hmm. um, so some of this work is um, in the chapter, and some of this work was done as part of a movement that the book was part of, and has been done um, before the second edition of the book. Um, but what, what the justifications when you when I interviewed doctors in the 90s about why they felt they needed to be detached. Um, and this goes way back in the literature. This was I interviewed them in the 1990s, but you can find literature going back to the 1860s about this. Is that doctors have claimed for a very long time in American medicine that detachment was the key to accurate diagnosis because accurate diagnosis depended on objectivity. And there was a notion. Of course, we now have whole schools of thought critiquing various theories of objectivity in science and in history, etc. But the doctor's common sense view that Sir William Osler exemplifies was what was a Cartesian view, which was that the mind was sort of like a projector. Remember old-fashioned projectors that projected light and images onto a screen? And that you needed a clear screen and a clear projection, and that had to be cognitively um, pure and devoid of any emotional feelings that would create interference. And that view um, that that was objectivity and that's how you had to look at the patient as an object of thought or an object of examination. And so, but the, the justification was that would make you a more effective doctor because you'd come up with the right diagnosis. That's what doctors have to do. They have to be good at diagnosing the patient and then effective at treating them. Those are the two parts of medicine. Getting the problem in, in focus clearly and offering effective treatment that the patient can take for a problem. So they thought that the, the getting the problem in focus, getting the right diagnosis required emotional objectivity. And then they also thought doing treatment, providing effective treatment required objectivity. And the, the knee-jerk example of that is a surgeon. How could you cut into a body if you were overly empathic at that moment? And of course there's truth to the idea that while you're cutting or doing a procedure, you might not want to be thinking about how it feels to be on the other end of that. I mean, that's kind of an obvious truth, and there's lots of ways of um, professionally making sure that you concentrate on the task and not on an irreverent or irrelevant, excuse me, not irreverent, irrelevant and distracting thought. But that, that's a very small part of medical practice. Most of medical practice is sitting with a patient in terms of effective treatment. It's not cutting their body. It's sitting with the patient and encouraging them to do what might effectively help ameliorate their problem. So that might be helping, um, encouraging them to change, you know, health-related uh, activities, smoking, drinking, obesity, exercise, um, dealing with domestic violence, um, uh, taking medication that they don't want to take but that might really help them. So. That's part of effective treatment as well, but the idea was you would do all of that better if you were emotionally detached.
Hmm. And I mean, so this, yeah, oh. we, we have research, I can tell you at some point, showing that neither of those things is true. But that's, oh. that's mm -hmm. why doctors, and then I'm sorry, the third reason, of course, is they were afraid of burning out, that they would just burn out if they cared too much for their patients. Sorry, we're going to Oh, no, no, that, that's fine, go. So it's, oh, excuse me, up before okay, me. Sure. let me just shut go it. So I'll just, I'm not going to answer it, but I'm going to try to get it to stop ringing, okay? <laughs> yeah, so the intention behind that was really to, they thought that that would help uh, contribute to patient well-being. Definitely. So it, it, had a, it had a positive, I mean, it was the intention was there to, uh, to uh, it was just thought, well, if you detach, you, know, you won't get emotionally, you won't burn out, you'll have clear vision of what the problem is, so that kind of that approach was um, kind of nurtured. And is, is that kind of the background? Why? Those are the rationalizations, rationalizations for yeah. detachment. I, the history is complicated. The history has to do with a kind of military model of medical training in the early 20th century at Johns Hopkins and other um, medical schools. I mean, even though detachment was an ideal before then, there was a period of medical training where it was almost all men living among men into their 30s, getting trained and having no families, no loving connections, like you said, and being on call all the time and being almost in a military detached mindset. And I mean, there's a lot of historical cultural things that actually contributed to detachment. But these, the, the thing that were said in the articles in JAMA and the New England Journal going into the 90s, um, the justifications for 150 years were that you needed physicians to have detached concern, um, a special concern in which all their own personal emotions were out of the picture and they had just a kind of cognitive appreciation of the patient and you needed it to be a, a pure diagnostician and effective um, treatment to provide effective treatment and 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 not burn out those three things and I totally think that doctors did this uh, everything most doctors in the history of medicine are very um, concerned with helping their patients so these these were, might have been motivated by the best of intentions but there was a view of the role of emotions that per, was pervasive is this this is also relate to what the, with uh, the work of George Lakoff where he talks about uh, enlightenment reasoning where it was like the idea was that reason was like this detached yes uh, you know un, unembodied yes. uh, way of looking and yes. you know that was and emotions were just kind of in the way and let's uh, kind of get rid of those emotions and reason is really just working with your mind and kind of logically working through yes problems uh -huh. yes exactly. That's why I have a whole chapter, with, you know, which we could talk about later. But yes, that was where um, the the history in the history of it, of thought in intellectual history in Western intellectual history, there was this view um, that that's what I, the Cartesian projector image I was giving to you was the, that was the view of the mind that the mind was sort of like a cognitive, um, purely informational um, receptor for and so that emotions would have just basically been like noise or uh, static. And now there's a new, uh, plenty of science that's kind of showing it doesn't work that way. So it's right. like a, a model that doesn't work and you kind of go into some of that. Uh, yes, yes. Those, and that, that yes. studies. Yes, and it's exciting. I will say one thing quickly, though, that not only do we have incredibly important work in psychology and neuroscience and, and behavioral economics now showing over and over that we're all, often our most serious decisions are made um, unconsciously and with emotional and other influences and the, the intellectual part is a post hoc rationalization. So we have a very different view of the mind now. Um, Haidt, Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T, has this picture that I love of us as elephant riders that our emotions and our um, dispositions are, are a huge elephant and our cognitive control is like a little tiny person on top of an elephant that can't really direct the elephant but we might as well be aware of where the elephant's going. Um, so our view of the mind has changed radically in the past 10 years since my book first came out. My book predicted a lot of um, philosophical reasons that the old Cartesian views wouldn't work, but now we've got a lot of empirical research that's very exciting. I just want to say quick, quickly though, the specific medical claims that you would be a better diagnostician and a more effective healer by being detached, those specific medical claims, there's wonderful research in medicine showing those things not to be true. There's direct observational studies showing that patients disclose much more information to emotionally engaged physicians and direct um, studies showing that adherence to treatment is much higher when there's an empathic connection. So we actually have a whole body of research now showing that if you want to 
get the history that leads to effective diagnosis. And if you want the kind of treatment alliance that helps uh, treatment be effective, that empathic engagement is much more likely um, to help with that than detachment. So that's a medical uh, objectivity kind of notion, but then there's also the notion of sympathy. Uh, and that's like a separate, that's like another um, kind of dynamics. Do, would you want to go into that perhaps, into yeah. kind of the nature of sympathy? Well, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot, I'm not going to do the philosophy of sympathy because then I will talk too long. There's Adam Smith, there's so many different thinkers, Hutchinson, Hutchinson, they're the moral um, sentiment theorists of the late 19th century, which again, Adam Smith was one of, and Hutchinson, um, they had theories about sympathy that are relevant for your project broadly, very relevant because they have to do with, I mean, even at the level of economic relations, the idea that we have sympathetic ties to our fellow humans. And I have a, I have a lot of um, regard for sympathy. I'm not anti-sympathy. It's just that I think that when you're in a clinical setting where you want your, your doctor to help you deal with uh, catastrophic thinking of your own in the face of terrible loss and fear and um, very frightening diseases and treatments, sympathy is less useful from your doctor or your therapist than clinical empathy where you need someone to be genuinely curious and open so you can get, the patient can help get a little bit wedge a wedge of um, light or air to help them think about their situation. So I'm all for clinical empathy and practice of medicine and psychiatry, but in the world, in the human world, I think we need sympathy as well as empathy. Mm -hmm. um, but sympathy, the difference being that the sympathy, really simple way to think of it for me, and those words are used differently. This is just the way I use them. For me, sympathy is if a friend tells me, um, uh, my boss is terrible, I, I ought to quit my job. In sympathy, I put myself in the same boat and say, boy, that's terrible you have to deal with your boss. You should quit your job. You deserve better. Whereas, which would, was fine in friendship, but would go very badly in the hospital where someone just says, you know, I can't possibly have breast cancer. This can't be true. And you don't want to say, yeah, you're right, it's not true. Or I can't possibly have this, you know, I don't know what treatment you know, is, could help me and you don't want to be all in it with them and say, yeah, it's impossible to make this decision. So um, sympathy allows you to just be a full-blown advocate for whatever feeling state your friend is subject to and just be in it with them. It's kind of a merger. Clinical empathy, in my, the way I've defined it anyway, it's you start with a feeling of, wow, your boss is terrible. Gosh, you know, look what you're going through. And you let the person's feeling about the boss um, inscribe itself on you. The person's feeling, and you think, God, when you think about that humiliating way that her boss talked to her in that meeting, and you feel angry and frustrated as your, your friend's telling you about it. But the, the clinical empathy would, would be also to wonder, but wait a minute, you know, this is what happened just now with the boss. Has it always been that way with the boss? Why is your friend in that state of mind now? And to say, you know, why, why you know, is it so hard right now? Because there's a lot at stake for your friend. Quitting the job may not be the best thing for your friend. So when there's a lot at stake, you don't want to just stay wholeheartedly resonant in one state of mind. Behind that is a theory of emotions is always involving some ambivalence and the idea that most of us are not subject to just one state of mind. So even your friend may have complicated feelings about her boss and even, mm -hmm. and even Ms. G with all the tragedy she was dealing with had a complicated feeling about whether to end her life or not. She made it seem like all she wanted was to end her life, but there was probably more to it. And the idea there's more to it and that there might be threads that doctors can work with to help patients be more resilient is why we can't just go whole hog over the first emotion that a patient expresses in sympathy, but be more um, curious about what is the specific individual most troubled about. Uh, I've done some uh, conflict resolution training and, and empathy and sympathy of have come up uh, in that. And one metaphor I saw was, was heard is that uh, if someone is sharing something and the spotlight is on them, the attention, the awareness is on them, and then sympathy is saying, oh, I've had that feeling too, or I feel so sorry for you, and it kind of takes the, the awareness and the spotlight onto you ah. uh, as like where the attention and awareness is. Whereas empathy keeps the spotlight on, in this case it would be the patient, um, where it, it's not about what's going on for you so much, it's like just reflecting back what it is you're hearing the, the patient or the people in conflict saying. So you're kind of like just a, a mirror 
in a sense, and keeping the focus and the spotlight of attention on, on that person. And so sympathy is kind of like the secondary uh, experience, like it's kind of like me too, or, you know, feeling, you know, sorry for someone or, or kind of uh, agreeing, saying, yeah, that's the way it is or something like that. Well, that's, do you mind if I, can I quote you on that when I teach? It's a fabulous, <laughs> it's a fabulous metaphor. It's a fabulous metaphor. And I think one aspect of it is one reason the me too, it's not just that it pulls attention away from the patient sort of accidentally. It does, I guess the crucial fact that's behind all my views is that each person is a world. Each person is a whole world of experience emotionally. And even if I have the same illness as someone, I mean, a, a, a woman physician, and a 45-year-old physician who had, had breast cancer, if she were to have sympathy because her 45-year-old woman patient had breast cancer and say, me too, um, and think that she knows now what this patient wants or needs, even though she has the same illness and there's no you know, cultural divide, let's say, she might get it completely wrong. Because mm -hmm. that other 45-year-old woman had a whole childhood and adulthood that this woman hasn't lived. And I think that we need to be radically um, um, modest about how much any one person has lived another person's life and can really be in their world. So that's why the only response that's appropriate morally to me to that awareness is curiosity. But, but warm, engaged curiosity, not treating the other as a spectacle to be curious about, but engaged curiosity where you let them move you because we are co-human so we can be moved by each other. But the curiosity then is to know more about what in particular it's like from the inside out for this individual and not for me. So I always say never say that you can um, put yourself in someone else's shoes. That's not empathy. It's not about you in their situation. It's about them in their situation. It's not ever about being in the same boat. Um, for all the reasons you said, it's about this other before you who is radically distinct from you, no matter how much you humanly share a set of emotions. Well, this sounds like a good point to uh, perhaps end this this hour discussion because uh, there's really a, an awful lot here to to discuss them. And you've offered, you know, to do another uh, discussion, so we we can end here and then pick up uh, again on uh, chapter three. <laughs> Thank you, Edwin. You know, you really are an incredible listener, and I feel like I'm talking a lot rather than having a conversation with you. Um, now, I'm not letting um, this be as much of a dialogue as you might want it to be now, because I I wanted to tell you as much as I could about the ideas and put them out there, because um, I think you wanted that. You wanted me to lay out my mm -hmm. ideas, but I'm very happy going forward to make sure that we do it, you know, I can talk for briefer amounts and go back and forth and respond to new thoughts and ideas and questions of yours because you've thought about this stuff so much. Yeah, so that's like, this is exactly how I would like it too, the way we're doing it, to really hear, to lay out what it is, your, the uh, outline of your book and, you know, it, I'm glad that we have more time to do it. I'd love it. Uh, this is it gives us a chance to, you know, really document this and kind of go into depth. So, um, I'll end the, uh, end the, the, the uh, recording.